Thank you that are in chapter six. Make sure you read those. It's not really long, not really hard to understand. Um, I said what I wanted to say about them the last time. Um, if you ever have any questions about them, just let me know. What I would like to do, though, is to uh, go to around page 149, 149, because uh, the concept that's brought up on that page is called the sampling distribution, and it's one of the most difficult to understand. That's not to be confused with a sample, okay? So, and you'll see a picture like this in your book. Probably, I think it's on the next page. But. And I want to tell you, I'm glad we're all hanging in here together, right? We're going to get through this class one way or the other, right? Make it to the end. All right. So the sampling distribution, and you can see a picture of what I just drew. As I said, I believe it's on page 150, and it is. Um, the sampling distribution is what we use, or what, what we're going to use, to connect the sample to the population, right? To see how accurate our sample is about the population. And it's a little difficult to understand the way it's presented in any book. So let's look at page 149 and, and let's tear it apart, uh, the part that says the sampling distribution. And by the way, I, want to not, I don't want to discourage you from coming to class, but if you ever feel sick, we had a student in here earlier when you weren't here and he's not feeling too well, but we record these classes, so there's no reason to come in and infect your colleagues. <laughs> you can just ask me for the link and I'll you can watch what happened in class, okay? Um, so here's what it says. Once we've selected a probability sample, according to the Epsom procedure. Now, what's that mean? That means, remember in the last class, I said that when we pick a sample randomly, right, we, we call that a probability sample, okay? Because every element that was out there in the population had an equal chance of getting picked. And if it's a probability sample, that equal probability of selection method that your book keeps talking about, Epsom, right? Um, if it's a probability sample, then we can start talking about the laws of probability and how to use the sampling distribution. So once you've pulled the sample using this technique, right, and you can do it, you can pull a sample like that using any one of the techniques that I asked you to read about in your book and that we only briefly talked about in class, right? So what do you know? once we've pulled the sample. And here's what we know. On the one hand, we can gather a great deal of information from the cases in the sample. So we pull the sample from the population. The sample is small and it's manageable, right? And we can analyze the heck out of it, can't we? We can do all kinds of things on a sample because the sample is very small and manageable, whereas the population isn't, okay? And it says, on the other hand, you don't know anything about the population. So while we can rip this apart and analyze it like crazy, we still don't know much about this. We're going to guess about this, 
or we're going to make an estimate about this using that. Eventually, hopefully, we'll all understand, including me, right? Eventually, we'll all understand how the sampling distribution will help us to know how accurate our sample is about estimating that. Okay? So we're going to estimate the mean of a population, or if we're going to estimate the proportion of a particular variable in a population, we're going to make that estimate by pulling a probability sample. We're going to work on the sample, and then we have to figure out the margin of error, if I can just say that, right? Figure out how accurate our sample is. What's the margin of error? It's never going to be a bullseye. It's never going to be right on. It's always going to be within a range. Okay, so continuing. So it says, on the other hand, we know nothing about the population. Indeed, if you had the information about the, probability, about the population, you wouldn't have to work with a sample, would you? You'd just do the whole thing. So the only reason that we work with a sample is so that we can generalize our findings. That's an important word in social research and social statistics, generalizability, right? We want to generalize from what we found in our sample to the population. That's the whole point of this whole class, really, at the end of the day. So when we use inferential statistics, we generally measure some variable, right? We're measuring a variable. Remember what variables are. And here are some examples, right? He gives you here. You can measure age or political party preference or opinions about abortion or anything. Those are all variables. They can take on different variables, different uh, attributes, different characteristics. So when we use inferential statistics, we generally measure some variable in the sample and then use that information from the sample to learn more about that variable in the population. That's the crux of the whole matter right there. Right? That's what we're trying to do in this class or in any inferential statistics class trying to make an estimate, an accurate estimate about a population from a sample, whether we're measuring a new drug or a new treatment in a hospital or who's going to win an election or what your attitudes are about anything, right? That's what this is all about. And he goes on to say that what we've been concerned with, these three things that he lists there, prior to this discussion, we're still concerned with here. We want to know the shape of a distribution. By the way, when, by the way, when we talk about the shape, remember we're talking about that, that uh, bell-shaped curve or whether it's skewed to the left or skewed to the right. <coughs> Are we okay with that? If, I'm, if we're not, just say so, right? We're looking at the shape. We want to know about where the center is, the measures of central tendency, where the, the, most of the cases cluster in, in a particular distribution, right? And then we want to know how spread out things are. So we want to know three things. Is the distribution kind of evenly distributed or is it skewed? Where's the center of it? And by the way, how spread out are the scores in that distribution? Or are they clustered or are they spread out? We still want to know those three things. So he goes on to say that clearly all three kinds of information can be gathered or computed on a variable that you're using in a sample. So if we were collecting the age in our last class, we said of the, of the a sample of people from Robinson County, right? I could work with that sample. I could know the measure of, I could know the mean, couldn't I? I could know the median and the mode. And I could also know the standard deviation if I wanted to, that that's a measure of dispersion. I could also know the interquartile range and the range. Those are also measures of dispersion, right? And I could also graph it using a histogram or uh, uh, just any other line graph and see the shape. I could do all of that with my sample, right? I can't do it with the population because I'm didn't. i not working with the numbers in the population. All right, so he says, clearly all three kinds of information can be gathered or computed on a variable from the cases in a sample. Just as clearly, none of the information is available for the population. You agree? Okay, except in rare instances, like in an IQ test, for example, they're designed to score the population in a perfectly normal shape. Don't ask me how they do it, but they claim that they do it, okay? 
Now, let's go on to the, on page 150, the second paragraph. In statistics, this is the key here to that little diagram on the top of that page, figure 6.1, and the one that I drew there on the uh, whiteboard. In statistics, we link the information from the sample to the population using the sampling distribution. And here's the kicker, here's the definition of a sampling distribution. Remember, a sampling distribution is not the sample, right? We have a distribution here in the sample, right? We have a distribution in the population, but this is something different. This is a sampling distribution. What is it? In italics, he says, it's theoretical, and so it doesn't exist in reality, which means the mathematicians have developed all kinds of uh, mathematical uh, formula to, uh, to prove that it's correct or true. So it's theoretical, probabilistic distribution of a statistic for all possible sa samples of a certain size. So, and we'll go on a little further with this in a moment, but I started to tell you about this in the last class. If I pulled a sample of 100 people from 50,000 people in a county, right? And then I put the 100 people back, and, and I, then I calculated the age of that 100, of the 100 people, the average age. And then I put the 100 people back and pulled another sample of 100 people and calculated the age of that, that second group, and then I threw them back into the pie, and I pulled another 100 and calculated the average age of the next sample, right? And I just kept doing that forever. Would, would you agree, or does it make sense to you, that every sample we picked would probably have a slightly different average age? I mean, to be exactly the same, we'd have to pick the exact same numbers. It would be hard to do that, probably, right? So we'd pick 100 people, we'd get an average age. We'd throw them back, we'd pick another 100 people, we'd get an average age. We'd put them back, pick another 100 people, get an average age. And none of them would be the same. But with the, what the mathematicians have told us with the sampling distribution, as long as it's a probability sample, is if you did that, if you did, infinitely, which by the way, you can't, right? You can't do something infinitely, you'd never end, would it? But if you were to do that infinitely, and every time you pulled a sample, you got an average age, and you put it on, and you drew it on a graph, we'll show that, we put it on a graph, you'd see that the average age of all the infinite numbers of samples, that 68.26% of them would fall between one and one, negative one and positive one standard deviation. And they said, if you keep doing that over and over and over and over again, your sampling distribution will have the exact same shape as the population does. <coughs> right? And that you just have to accept as gospel because mathematicians have worked that out, right? <coughs> we accept that as being true. So let's take a look and, and go a little bit further now and see if uh, what I said uh, clarifies anything that he said, your author's saying. So he, well, I'm going back to that paragraph and reading it again. In statistics, we link information from the sample to the population with the sampling distribution. The sampling distribution is theoretical, it's probabilistic, right? And just an infinite number of samples of a particular size. That is, the sampling distribution of a statistic Right? which would be uh, the average age would be the mean or the proportion of people that uh, uh, were men or women or whatever. So the mean and the proportion are the two statistics we look at, right? based on every possible combination of cases in a population. So if every case in Robinson County is in my initial pot and I pull 100, right? I have an infinite number of combinations in there that we can't even calculate, that every time I put 100 back, I pull another 100. It's just an infinite number of mixed up people I could be picking, right? A crucial point about the sampling distribution is that its characteristics are based on the laws of probability. So 
they're not based on empirical information. They're based on the laws of probability. So when I keep saying the mathematicians have worked it out, well, they've worked out the laws of probability, okay? Um, you can't see the sampling distribution. You can't create a sampling distribution in real life. You, the reason you can't is because it says it's based on an infinite number of samples, and as I said a moment ago, you'd never end. You could never pull an infinite number of samples. And the last sentence in that paragraph, which is so true, the sampling distribution is the central concept in inferential statistics. This is the big enchilada. I mean, this is the concept that allows us to predict who's going to win elections, which pills will make us better or worse, right? Um, who's going to do better on exams to make inferences about a population. This is the, the key in any scientific endeavor, not just ours, what we're in here doing. Okay, so, so there, the next section is, is entitled The Three Distributions Used in Inferential Statistics. What are those three distributions? Here they are. This is a distribution, the, the population. This is a distribution, that's the sample. And the sampling distribution is the third. So there are three distributions that we need to be concerned with from here on out. And he goes on to say under number one, the population distribution of the variable, which while empirical is unknown. What does that mean? If I was dealing again with my example of the ages of people in a county of 50,000 people, right? If I wanted to know, hey, does that, is there an average age for these 50,000 people? The answer would be yes. It's just that we don't know it, right? Because the number's too big, right? We don't know it. So it's empirical and unknown to us, okay? Number two, well, let me do number three first, and then I'll come back to number two. Number three, the sample distribution of the variable is empirical, right? We can see it, we can work with it, we pull the sample, it's manageable, we can do what we want to do with it. It exists and it is known. The shape the central tendency and the dispersion of the variable can be ascertained for the sample. So we can calculate the average, uh, the mean, or the proportion, or draw a graph and look at the shape of it. We can figure out the standard deviation, or the range, or the interquartile range on a sample, as I said earlier. And then the last sentence is important in that number three. It says, remember, however, that the information from the sample is important Primarily insofar as it allows the researcher to know about the population. It's useless just to know about your sample unless you can relate it to the population you were trying to make an estimate about. And now let's go back to number two, which is the sampling distribution, which is the, the uh, most abstract concept here. Right? The sampling distribution of the variable is non-empirical. <coughs> What's that mean? It means it doesn't exist in reality. It's theoretical, okay? Because of the laws of probability, and those laws, by the way, were developed by mathematicians, right? Because of the laws of probability, a great deal can be known or is known about this distribution. Specifically, we can know the shape, the central tendency, and the dispersion of the distribution, and they can all be deduced. Therefore, the distribution can be adequately characterized. Well, look. The only way we can know things about this is because of the laws of probability that we're going to talk about in a second, okay, coming up in, in your reading, right? This does not exist in reality. This exists in reality, right? And this is, but we don't know the, the information that we want to know. This exists in reality, and we do know the information about it, right? What we don't know is how accurate our sample is as a reflection of what's really going on in the population. That's what we want to find out. That's what we want to know. Hi, Ryan. Uh, constructing a sampling distribution is the uh, on the bottom of the page. This might be helpful to you. And again, it's kind of a recap of what I've been saying, but you can't read this or talk about it enough in order for it to finally go in. The sampling distribution is theoretical. 
which means that it is never actually constructed. Okay? The sampling distribution is theoretical, which means it can never be constructed. Why can't it be constructed? Because it's based on an infinite number of sample poles, and you never reach infinity. Okay? However, to understand better the structure and function of the distribution, let's consider an example of how we might construct one of them. Right? Suppose you wanted to gather some information about the ages of a community of about 10,000 people. Right? You draw an equal probability of selection method sample of 100. This is similar to the example I was just using for a county of 50,000 people. You, you pull a sample of 100 and you ask all 100 people their age and then you calculate the average age for the 100 people and then you put them back, in his example, into the 10,000 and pull another sample, right? So he says, you ask all 100 respondents their age and you use those individual scores to compute the mean age of 27. And he drew a line up in figure 6.2 just to show you where he would put sample number one. If he was putting a dot there, right, on a graph, you'd put sample number one at age 27. He goes on to say that, if, if you read the text, he goes on to say, hey, we're going to pull another sample of 100, and we're going to calculate the average age of that group. And he does that in, in this example, and he gets 30, and he's showing you where he put that on the line. Do you see that on your line? Yes, sir. So you only put the overall um, mean of the ages on the sample line? That's, yeah, he's just giving you, an, you got that line there on the bottom with the ages 24, 26, 28. In between the 24 and 26 is 25. In between the 26 and 28 is 27, and on and on. So what he's just trying to demonstrate here, what your author is just trying to demonstrate is if I pull the sample of 100 people and I got an average age of 27, that's where I put it, right there. Right? And if I pulled another sample of, and I happen to get an average age of 30, that's where I put it, right there. Right? What he goes on to say in the text, and we'll take a look at it in a minute, but as he keeps doing that, right, what do the laws of probability tell us? As he keeps doing that, most of the cases are going to cluster somewhere between 26 and 28. That's what he's telling us. So let's go on and see exactly how your author explains it, okay? So he says, this score is noted on the graph in figure 6.2. I'm on the top of page 151. Note that this sample is one of countless possible combinations of 100 people taken from the 10,000, right? So every time you pull a sample, you're going to get a slightly different number. But what the laws of probability tell us is that most of them are going to cluster around the center, and there's going to be fewer that are going to be really young and fewer that are really old, but most of them are going to be in some kind of middle range, right? It says, now replace the first 100 respondents, draw another sample of the same size, and again compute the average. Assume that the mean for the second sample is 30, and note this sample outcome, and he does that up on the top of the page. This second sample is another of countless combinations of 100 people taken from the population of 10,000. And the mean of 30 is another of millions of possible sample means that you could have come up with through this process. He says, replace the respondents and draw still another sample. Calculate and note the mean and replace this third sample and draw a fourth and continue this an infinite number of times, which you can't do, which we're just going to use as a as a heuristic device, right? Calculating and noting the mean for each sample. Now try to imagine what figure 6.2 would look like after tens of thousands of individual samples had been collected and the means had been computed for each sample. By the way, that would create a distribution of the means of tens of thousands of samples. Do you understand that? Right? That by doing what he just described, we'd create a distribution of means for each of the 100 pop, uh, that we, samples that we put, picked, right? Each of the 100. And we'd get a, an average age for each of those samples. By the way, that's a sampling distribution. OK? It's a distribution of the sample means, 
or a distribution of the sample proportions. It's not the sample, okay? It's tens of thousands of samples, and we create a distribution of numbers, theoretically, right, based upon an infinite number of poles. Now, if this isn't something that's murky and hard to understand, I don't know what is. But it is, if it's, you know, you have to think about it. And maybe when you get to be 68 like me, you'll say, <laughs> yeah, I get, get it, right? Or maybe you get it now. Maybe you're really onto it. So, but don't beat yourself up if it's not going in so easily right now. Okay. Now, he says, for one thing, he goes on in the middle of the page. For one thing, we know that each sample will be at least slightly different from every other sample. Does that make sense to everybody? Right? Since the sample is very unlikely, since it is very unlikely, I'm sorry, that we will sample exactly the same 100 people twice. Because each sample will be unique, each sample mean will be slightly different in value. We also know that not all samples will be representative, even if you follow Epsom closely. So even if we do the equal probability of selection method, there is no guarantee that the sample we picked will be representative of the population. You could have picked a sample that's a bogus sample, right? Let me draw something here, too, for you. So if I keep picking samples from my population and plotting the average ages, right, most of them are going to fall in here, in this area, and few are going to fall here. You with me? Anybody not with me? So I could have, by chance, picked a sample that was really down here, which is an, right? I, it could happen. I could be unlucky, right? I could pull a sample. What I know is that if I had my standard deviations, three of them, right? I know that about 68% of the time, my, my samples will produce an average age that's in this area here, right? But I also know that it's possible very rare event, but it's possible I could have picked a sample here or a sample that is representative up there, in which case I would be saying, oh, the average age of this population is uh, 18, when in fact it's really 58, because I picked all young people by accident. So what we're, not, what we're learning, of course, is that th this probability theory is a theory about estimation that has room for error. We just want to know how likely it is we are correct in predicting to a bigger population. We'll never know exactly. Never know exactly. That's why in science, before the Food and Drug Administration approves a new drug for, you know, or whatever, they don't do it based on one test, right? They do it based on many tests, and they uh, want to make sure that the tests all fall within a certain range so that they'll get the result that they are looking for. OK, so let's go back to page 151. Um, I'm in the middle of the page again. It says, now try to imagine what figure 6.2 would look like after tens of thousands of individual samples had been collected and the mean had been computed for each sample. What shape, what mean, or what standard deviation would this distribution of sample means have after you collected all of the possible combinations of 100 respondents for your samples. It should look, it, by the way, if you did that, it should look something like this, according to the laws of probability. On the let's, next to the last paragraph on that page, we also know that not all samples will be representative. That's what I just said, right? 
Even if we follow Epsom closely, for example, we continue taking samples of 100 people long enough, we'll eventually choose a sample that includes only the very youngest residents. Likewise, some of our samples will include only senior citizens and will have means that are much higher than the population mean. Common sense suggests, however, that such non-representative samples will be rare and that most sample means will cluster around the true population mean. So remember, this is the average we want to get, the average age for the population. We know what it is for the sample, but if we keep pulling sample means for this population and plotting them here, most of them are going to fall here. Rarely will they fall there. That's all you need to try to understand for now. But we're always doing this to guess, to make an estimate of what the, what the population, population parameter is. Excuse me, let's make sure I use the right words, right? If I'm doing the average age, I'm looking at the sample mean in order to try to, and I wrote this the last time, I've got the sample mean in order to try to estimate the population parameter. Remember I wrote that up there? Parameter or characteristic. That's what I'm really trying to get at. So on the bottom of the page on 151, to illustrate further, assume that we somehow come to know that the true mean uh, age of the population is 10, 000, of 10,000 people is 30. He's just saying, make believe you already know that. Because, as we have just seen, most of the sample means will, be, will also be approximately 30. The sampling distribution of these sample means should peak at around 30. So if you did this an infinite number of times, what he's saying is that the peak of this curve will be identical to the peak of this curve if you were able to know what this was. All right? This is an important point. The sampling distribution that's theoretical, right, when it's fully created, has a mean and a median and a mode, by the way, and a standard deviation that is identical to the population mean without you even knowing the population mean. Right? The sampling distribution is identical. So if you can estimate the mean of a sampling distribution, you then have estimated the mean of the population. Hopefully this will become clearer as we work through some exercises on it. So to, illust to illustrate further, assume that we somehow come to know that the true mean age population is 10,000 uh, and the average age is 30. Because we have just seen... Because, as we have just seen, most of the sample means will also be 30, the sampling distribution of these sample means should peak at 30. Some of the samples will be non-representative, which means they miss the mark. But the frequency of missing the mark should decline as you get further away from 30. So if you pick a sample of 60 and the average is 60, right, that's going to be up here. That's going to be, there aren't going to be too many of them, is all he's saying. Or if you pick a sample of 10, age 10, it's going to be down here. There are not going to be too many of them. Most of them are going to be in the middle. Some of the samples will be non-representative and their means will miss the mark, but the frequency of the misses should decline as you get farther away from the mean of 30. That is, the distribution should slope to the base as we move away from the population value. A sample mean of 29 or 30 should be common. A sample means of 20 or 40 should be rare. The samples are random, so their means should miss an equal number of times on both sides. The law of probability says that if you keep pulling samples, you'll get an equal number of, of, in, of incorrect samples on this side of the mean and an equal number of incorrect on this side of the mean. And you'll always get about 68.26 between negative 1 and positive 1 standard deviations. Last uh, sentence or two, this, the samples are random, so their means should miss an equal number of times on either side of the population value, and the distribution itself should therefore be roughly symmetrical. In other words, the sampling distribution of all possible sample means should be approximately normal, and it will resemble the distribution presented uh, above in 6.3, the figure 6.3. And then it says, recall that from the previous chapter, chapter 5, that on any normal curve, cases close to the mean, closest to the mean, are negative 1 to positive 1 standard deviation, and are common, and, excuse me, and they're common, and cases far away from the mean, 
beyond three standard deviations are rare, okay? We'll do some exercises maybe in the next class on that. I want to right now look at the two theorems, okay? These are two theorems that are related to the laws of probability in mathematics, and I think they're important for you to really understand. Uh, these are the things that we take as given in order to understand probability theory, okay? And by the way, pay attention to the symbols too. But let's just look at the little, in, uh, where it says two theorems on page 152 in the middle of the page, the little indented part where it says, if repeated random samples, he says of size n, I like to say of a particular size, right? If repeated random samples of a particular size are drawn from a normal population that has a particular mean and a particular standard deviation, then the sampling distribution of sample means will be normal, okay? So what is he, what's that first theorem telling us that? If we, if we pick samples that are of a certain size from the population, we're going to create a distribution, such as the one I drew there, that has a mean and a standard deviation that is very similar to what it would be for the population if we were to know the population. By the way, the formula for the standard deviation, and don't worry too much about it, is written also in that little paragraph. It says, and a, a mean and a standard deviation of the standard deviation divided by the square root of n. We'll explain that in a moment, okay? So let's look at where he says to translate what that theorem says, okay? If we begin with a trait that is normally distributed across a population, He's saying IQ scores are normally distributed. And take an infinite number of equal sized random samples from that population. Then the sampling distribution of sample means will be normal. If we know that the variable is distributed normally in the population, we can assume that the sampling distribution will be normal. Listen to what he's saying there. We we don't know, by the way, if the ages that in our example were normally distributed. We could have had a bunch of old people or a bunch of young people, right? But he's saying for probability to work, we have to kind of presume that the population that we drew our samples from was normal in shape, not skewed, right? That's one thing that he's saying. But the mathematician said we don't know that for a fact. We don't really know for the populations that we're dealing with whether the distributions are normal, in fact, in shape. The next theorem, which we'll talk about momentarily, the mathematicians corrected for that problem because they said that if you have a large enough sample size, then you can presume that the population was normal in shape. Okay? So that there are two theorems here at work. The one we just talked about and the one on the next page on 153, which is called the Central Limit Theorem, right? And it says, if repeated samples of, of size n, I like to say a particular size, are drawn from any population that has a particular mean and standard deviation, as n becomes larger, the sampling distribution of sample means will approach normal normality. So the two things that we need to worry about is that the samples are picked randomly and that the sample size is big enough, right? That the samples are picked through Epsom and that the sample sizes are big enough. If we can, if we do those two things, if we meet those two criteria, right, then we know that we can apply the laws of probability. If we can apply the laws of probability, we can then work with the sampling distribution in order to try to understand how accurate of a representation of the population our sample finding is. One other thing I want to tell you is that um, the sampling distribution, which looks like the kind of normal curve we've been dealing with, right? And then we have standard deviation markers I've been saying, right? This is just an important bit of vocabulary that you should make sure you know. When we talk about uh, um, the normal curve, 
with, in, in the context of a sample or a population, we talk about standard deviations one, two, three, and then negative one, two, three. When we talk about the sampling distribution, right, we don't call it the standard deviation. I wish we did, but they don't. They call it the standard error of the mean, okay? The standard error of the mean. That's an important phrase for you to know. And by the way, the standard error of the mean is nothing more than the standard deviation of the sampling distribution, all right? So if we're talking about a, a, a sampling distribution, I really shouldn't say negative one standard deviation to positive one standard deviation. I should say negative one standard error of the mean to positive one standard error of the mean, okay? The stand, one more time, the standard error of the mean, right, is nothing more than the standard deviation of the sampling distribution. Let me just see if we have time to do one of these. No, we don't. All right, let's let's go on to chapter seven, okay? Now remember, what the last chapter was about, what this chapter is about, is making an estimate, right, of something that we want to know about. And there are some important terms that start coming up here. And um, I'm just going to have to read them. And you can memorize them. But since I let you use your books, you need to know where they are in your books and so on. Right? So let's look at what were the purpose of this chapter is at the bottom of page 7, uh, of chapter 7, excuse me, at the bottom of page 160. It's the object of this branch of inferential statistics is to estimate a population value or a parameter, remember that's what we called it, from the statistic that you compute from a sample. So the average age of a sample is called a statistic. The average age of the population that I'm trying to guess is called a parameter, right? You're already familiar with public opinion polls and election projections. The most common application of these techniques, polls and surveys on every conceivable issue, et cetera, exist out there. The last sentence on the bottom of that page, right? The standard procedure for estimating population values is to construct a confidence interval. Now, that we're going to construct an interval. We're going to say, how confident can I be that my sample finding is um, accurate, an accurate estimate? How confident can I be? This is where that whole idea of, of margin of error comes in, right? You can be confident within a range of plus or minus five, or confident within a range of plus or minus three, or whatever, right? By the way, when we're testing new drugs for people, for health conditions, we want to have a very small margin of error, don't we? And when we're guessing who's going to win an election, maybe we're willing to put up with a 5% margin of error on either side. It's not life and death. But if I was doing a drug for some disease, I'd want to have a margin of error of maybe one on either side because I want to make sure people don't die uh, when I start passing out this drug, all right? So we want to construct a confidence interval, which on the bottom of the page is a math defined as a mathematical statement that says the parameter lies within a certain interval or range of values. The parameter lies within. Right? The parameter is the, st is the information or the characteristic of the population that we're trying to estimate. We know what it is for the sample, right? When uh, we want to know who's going to win an election or, or whatever. We know what it is for the sample. We want to know what it is for the population. And we want to know how confident we can be that our sample is an accurate estimate. Can we be confident within 3%, within 5%, within 1%, etc.? Or maybe we can't be confident at all. So it says, 
It's a mathematical statement that says that the parameter lies within a certain interval or range of values. For example, a confidence interval might say 68% plus or minus 3, which is really another way of saying between 65 and 71%, right? Of Americans approve of capital punishment. In the media, the central value of the interval is 68%. Uh, in this case, and it's usually stressed. But it's important to realize that the population parameter, the percentage of all Americans who approve of capital punishment, could be anywhere between 65 and, 60 and 71, right? Now, by the way, that's a public opinion statement, but we could be doing the same thing for a new pharmaceutical that we're inventing for a particular disease, right? How many people um, will die or get a, a bad side effect from this particular pill? Well, if the range was... Um, between 65 and 71 percent, that's not too cool, is it? Right? So you want to be aware of what we're trying to do here. Okay, so estimation selection uh, criteria, bias and efficiency. Estimation procedures are based on sample statistics. So we're making an estimate about a population parameter based upon a statistic from a sample. Which of the many available sample statistics should be used? Now, so what is he, what's he asking us? What statistics in a sample are legitimate? when we're trying to estimate a population. By the way, the answer is going to be, it'll be coming up, but the answer is going to be a statistic, is the, the mean, a statistic of the sample called the mean, or a statistic of the sample called a proportion. You can use those two sample statistics. Both of those are presumed not to be biased, right? And they're both presumed to be efficient. We'll talk about what that means a little bit now and then we'll continue it in the next class. So estimates should be based on sample statistics that are unbiased and efficient. So here's the discussion of bias, right? An estimator is unbiased if the mean of its sampling distribution is equal to the population of interest. Hmm. Right? So we can say that an estimator is not biased if the mean of the sampling distribution is the same as that. Then it's not biased. If it wasn't the same, then we would say it is biased. We know from the theorems that we just talked about in Chapter 6 that sample means meet this criteria. How do we know that? Because remember one of the theorems is that if you pull an infinite number of samples from a population, you'll create this kind of a shape and you'll, and you'll get a mean there that is identical to the mean there if you did this an infinite number of times. By the way, that tells us, that theorem or that theory tells us that using the mean, right, fulfills the obligation that we have an estimator that is not biased. So, again, the mean of a sampling distribution of sample means, which we will note symbolically, and by the way, pay attention to that mu and the subscript um, with the x bar. When we talk about a sampling distribution, remember what I said before, the standard deviation of a sampling distribution is called the st uh, standard error of the mean. But when I talk about, and he's got this picture in the book there, you see that? That's the mean of the sampling distribution of sample means. This is the mean of the sampling distribution of sample means. By the way, just for the record, right? This is the mean of the population. That's how we write that, right? And this is how we write the mean of the sample, right? And this one we write So those are the symbols we need to be concerned about, right? Right? When I say the mean of a sample, or when you see X bar in an article you're reading for a class, you should know they're talking about the mean of a sample. If you see this little mu, this little scripted M, you know they're talking about the mean of the population. 
if you see the mu with the little subscript x bar, they're talking about the mean of the sampling distribution. Right? Three things we should just clean up our thinking with. Right? Three ways, three symbolic representations. I guess class is over, huh? So I'll see you on Friday. Thank you for being here.